Good morning. All right. Um, please turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. So we're continuing on in our series, the Gospel, Know It, Live It, Share It. And we're actually spending a second day in the Live It category today. So I'm going to read from Matthew 7, starting in verse 24. Give you another second. Matthew 7, 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine but does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his hand, house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So keep your fingers there near that um, verse. We're going to talk about it, give you a little intro first. Two of the biggest goals we see in the Gospel of Matthew, and the first one's kind of a review of the last couple days, is an explanation of what the Gospel is. It is seen as Jesus' birth, his teaching, his relationships, his miracles, his death, his resurrection. Um, and then the second, as well as what it looks like for disciples of Jesus to live that gospel out in real life. And that's what we've been doing, to, that's what we're doing today and what we did yesterday. Focusing on that second goal, our passage in Matthew 7 is the conclusion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which went all the way from Matthew 5 and then finished off in Matthew 7. And in that Sermon on the Mount, he reorients his followers' expectations to what it looks like to live in God's kingdom. It's a reorientation. They assumed, the people assumed they knew what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, but he had to teach them about what it looked like in reality to live that out. He had to change the expectations of the people to understand that following God was more than following just an external list of rules, but it was an internal heart change. In other words, the inside or inward change that God wanted to make was as important or more important than the outward change that would come. So the, in, the inward self was pivotal here to understand the Sermon on the Mount. Let me give you a couple examples. First, in Matthew 5.21, Jesus said, Do not murder. Do not murder. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. judgment. Takes it a step further. Love for your neighbor in 5.43. You've heard it said... Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So these are just two examples from the many spheres of life that Jesus addressed on the Sermon of the, on the Mount. The audience listening would have certainly agreed with Jesus when he told them not to murder and to love your neighbor. That was part of, their, that was part of the law. That was part of their Jewish heritage. They understood that. Um, what they didn't, that was part was obvious. They were reasonable requests, but what they were not familiar with was taking it to the next level. Um, when he added that it wasn't, it wasn't just murder towards another person that was wrong, but it was anger as well, people would have been shocked. And in our second example, Jesus said, not only would you love your neighbor, but you should love your enemies. And that was kind of shattering, earth-shattering to them. We don't, we just don't know, we don't think that way naturally, right? We don't think that way, let's love my enemies, let's love the people that are around me, I can do that. It's e easy to love my fellow Christians that I go to church with and I get along with, but it's a lot tougher when we're talking about enemies. Would you guys agree with that? Is it tougher to love people that are, don't love us back? Is it tough to do that? Anyone ever have a tough time with that? I have too. Okay, at least half of you. Okay. And I found that we do some of these very things that the early, these early Christians did as well. Obey the letter of the law without a heart change. Because this kind of heart change can only happen through the gospel. So here's a personal example from growing up. So my, I had a younger brother, two years younger, Andy. Um, and we would grow up and we got along well. We played everything, baseball, soccer, played video games, did everything together. Um, but my mom always had to remind me not to hit my younger brother. And I don't know why, I never really hit him, but 
so what I would do, I wasn't much of a hitting him kind of person. I was more of a uh, make fun of and intimidate and kind of just uh, be sarcastic to kind of thing and tease him. So I would tease Andy and do whatever I could to get under his skin. Because, of course, brothers and sisters, we know how to get under each other's skins because we know each other really well. So I would do whatever I had to to get him mad, wait till he turned red, and then he would hit me. And so he did it. Then my mom would come, what did you do? Well, I didn't do anything. I didn't hit him. He hit me. So was I innocent? No, I wasn't, was I? I wasn't innocent. I was obeying the letter of the law on that because I, sure, I didn't hit my brother. I did exactly what my mom told me not to do. I, what she told me to do, not hit him. So I was like, that, I did it right. But I wasn't innocent because I was following the letter of the law and not actually understanding the whole heart behind it. I wasn't loving my brother or caring about him. I was getting him, I was doing what I knew I needed to do to get him mad so he would hit me and he would get in trouble. Um, that's kind of a funny little kid example, but I think most of us can relate to that kind of rule keeping on some level, can't we? We do whatever it is that we know right up to the line to not do exactly what's wrong, but our heart isn't with us. So back to our passage, um, we're going to be starting in 724 of Matthew. Jesus was in the process of revolutionizing the religious landscape all around him, and this time the stakes have been raised. Jesus didn't lower the standards, he raised the standard. He knew our propensity to make a few external changes without changing anything in the inside. He knows what it's like. We can just do a couple, sure, I can check a couple things off the list, and I'm going to feel a lot better about myself, but that doesn't change anything about the inward reality of our hearts, does it? Matthew 7, 24, I'm going to read it verse by verse here. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So this parable is kind of simple. It's a parable about one man building a house on the rock foundation and another man building it on a sand foundation when it's emphasizing how important it is for our actions to line up with Jesus's teaching. So it's easy to hear the teachings of Jesus and agree with what's read or spoken, isn't it? You hear it be like, yeah, I've heard this before. I agree with that. How many times have you heard a sermon, a challenge, a devotional that really resonated with you? At the moment, you're like, yeah, I get that. But hearing good teaching is one thing, but hearing and then acting is what obedience is all about. Hearing and then acting is real obedience. The person who hears and puts those words into practice is building on the rock foundation. This person has heard the words of Jesus. You could say that they actually have a solid theology of who God is. They study his word, they know him, but the person also puts that theology into practice through practical life application. Not because of their own goodness, because of Christ working in and through them because of the gospel. They know the truth and they live the truth. I think we can relate to the word picture Jesus is using, too, with this whole idea of the the foundation that we're building here. A couple of years ago, I was driving to a youth event. I live in Lancaster City. I talked about Philadelphia. That's where I was born and raised, like the song. But uh, then I moved to Lancaster after college and seminary. um, And there's an amusement park. um, Well, anyway, I'll get to that. So I live in Lancaster City. And all the way, I, I work in Parksburg, which is going towards, going towards Chester County. And as I was driving one day, right in the middle is an area like Dutch Wonderland and the Lancaster Outlets and all kinds of things there. And I was driving down Route 30 for a youth event. And as I was driving, it started raining. I was like, okay, it's raining. And then the next thing you know, it was torrential downpours. I turned on the radio and they're like, get off the road. And I was like, uh-oh, this is a little too late for that. So I was in the middle of the road going down. And it flooded so quickly that anything that wasn't pretty much bolted down was floating. They actually had life rafts on Route 30, right by Dutch Wonderland and Amusement Park, right there in the middle there, actually helping people get out of cars. Everything that wasn't bolted down was floating. And this all happened within minutes. Um, I was able to divert around and get to a side street and get to where I was going. Not, Not part of the story. But the whole theme there is that I saw with my own eyes what it looked like when something wasn't attached or built to a foundation. It just easily, it easily falls out of place and floats away. It wasn't on a good foundation. And the metaphor speaks to storms in our lives too. When a person comes to Christ, they're absolutely set on a firm foundation that cannot be moved. 
If you are a follower in Jesus, like I've said the last couple days, you cannot be moved. You can never lose that salvation. Because of grace, we didn't do anything to get it. We can do nothing to lose it. You are secure in that salvation. Um, however, this verse also speaks to believers to make sure they're producing fruit in their lives. We're talking about someone who's knowing it and living it. So if you want to be able to live it and produce spiritual fruit, um, that's going to be a natural consequence of being abiding and being attached to the vine. And so when we're not, when we're not set on that foundation and attached to the vine, we tend to lose focus of what's happening and become unproductive and unfruitful Christians. Um, the actions that happen as a result of hearing, hearing the word of, Christ, of Jesus. <clears throat> This Christian life that is standing with Christ on the solid rock foundation cannot be moved regardless of the storms of life. I'm going to read two verses here. I'm going to go to Colossians 2.7 first. Bear with me as I look that up. Colossians 2.7. Colossians 2.7. I'm going to read 6 and 7. Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So the idea here is you're walking in him and rooted and built up and firmly established. So when we're hearing it and then doing it and showing that we're there on the foundation, we're actually showing the spiritual fruit that comes from it. Ephesians 4.14 Ephesians 4.14. Four, I'm going to go back to 13 again. Looking at it. Until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So as we're, there's one sense, like I said, in which we're, we are, grounded in the reality and the truth of the gospel. But even as Christians, it is possible to become an unfruitful, unproductive Christian. Um, you could talk to anyone who's been a believer for a while, and we can look at periods in our life that have been less than productive because not being attached to the vine and just not continually maturing in Christ. So we don't want to be people who are tossed to and fro by every wave and every thought that comes before us. We want to be people who can stand strong when life gets difficult move back to our passage in Matthew, looking at verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. So right here, we see Jesus moving on to discuss the foolish man who hears his teaching and does not put it into practice. The opposite of what we saw in the last verse. That person is like a man building his house on the sand. Um, a commentator, Leon Morris, in um, the Pillar Commentary series, one of my favorite, said this, We should not understand a deliberate choice of sand, but a failure to take seriously the necessity for a solid foundation. The man described is the one who hears Jesus and perhaps enjoys the process, but who does not put into practice what he has heard. That's interesting, because most people... I know, don't build their dream house on a sand foundation. They don't go to say, I want my beach house here to be right between the boardwalk and the water. If you've ever been to Ocean City, New Jersey, or any beach really that has a, has a boardwalk close to the water, you know that the water, after the afternoon and the tide starts coming in, the water comes right up against the boardwalk. Nobody would build their house in between that area, right? Nobody willfully does that and says, I want my house to get washed away. No. Um, most people don't try to do that. Um, Leon Morris, in his commentary, he's acknowledging that no reasonable person would do that. However, the foolish person doesn't become wise until he actually builds on the foundation. So building your house on the sand isn't, isn't saying, I want to build my house on the sand. It's just saying, I don't want to build my house on a foundation, if that makes sense. Nobody wakes up saying, I want to graduate from high school and my, I want my life to be a disaster. Does anyone ever say that? No. Nobody says that. Um, nobody wants that to happen. But as we see here in this passage, it's not just the person who chooses to build, to have that lifestyle and build on the sand. It's the person who chooses not to build on the rock foundation. 
We're going to move on here. Verse 27, And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. When the stormy trials of life hit the foolish man who built his house on the sand, his life will fall to a great crash. And I think there's different depths to this application. First, the person who does not have a relationship with Jesus has no foundation for this life and the life to come for all eternity. The person who doesn't know Jesus has no foundation. Only forgiveness through the gospel will give that person a solid footing to know God, a holy and righteous God. But second, in this life, only the person who knows Jesus and then puts his words into practice, who knows him and puts his words into practice, will be able to stand through the storms of life and bring God glory in the process. Um, So we're talking right here, once we're talking about Christians, we're talking about the Christian who can stand the trials of life, overcome temptations, and be able to stand strong in the midst of it, actually still producing fruit after the storm, Versus the Christian who has the storm come and is totally knocked down. Totally knocked down and becoming unproductive and unable to be that light in a dark world that Christians are called to be, right? So this final parable in the Beatitudes, because we're ending up the Beatitudes here in chapter 7, this final one leaves us with an important question that I think we all need to answer. How can I become a person who hears the word and lives out what he or she hears while staying away from a rigid legalistic response, which isn't, which isn't obedience at all. So in other words, how do I put this passage into practice? How do I do that? I want to give you a couple of examples to try, to try to help you put that into practice. First, like I said, I don't want it to be, we're not just rule followers, right? We're more than rule followers, like my example earlier. Just following the rules doesn't make you obedient. Obedience is the heart change, the inward reality that leads to the outward change. So two examples. Would you be okay getting surgery from a person who spent 10 years in medical school, which is great, reading books and, doing, and listening, hearing about surgery, but never actually pre- performing a surgery in real life? Would you be okay with that? They had 10 years of education. They never did a surgery or practice, but they have 10 years of education. Would anyone want to do that? Be the first, the guinea pig? Probably not, right? Of course not. You need to know the person went through a legitimate form of study, and even better, actually went through a, like, a residence process of practicing that and doing surgery on a whole bunch of other people under supervision before he ever touches you, right? Imagine agreeing to let a surgeon perform their first operation on you. That'd be scary. Another example I had there was, um, from my own life, was as I started, I'll get into this later, but Melody learning to play the violin under a teacher. I think she started when she was five, it's my wife. So when we started dating, and you guys will probably think this is silly, the questions I'm asking here, because I... I, uh, I played music in high school, but I never, I didn't take it as seriously as you guys. And so some of these things that I'm going to read here might sound silly, but anyway. When we started dating, I began attending various concerts th- that she directed at school and watched her perform for the things in the city. And when, I've re- when I read performer bios in the programs, they always listed the school that the person went to and the teacher they studied under. I got the school part, but the teacher they studied under, I didn't understand that at first. It took a little while. So... I thought it would be interesting, and so I asked Melody about it. And she told me that listing the teachers, like their school and the person under them, gave them credibility and reveals who the performer is seeking to emulate. That person like, shows, who am I trying to be like? So, that's, and so what I learned there is helping me to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple. Just like I asked Melody, why are you listing the person you studied under? Well, I'm learning to emulate that person. That's who I want to learn to be like. Um, I think we should be doing the same thing as we follow Jesus. If we are truly his disciples, we're learning to be like him and do the things that he did. Um, He gave us the power of his Holy Spirit to do that. So similar to how a surgeon not only studies book about surgery, but also practices surgery with an attendant for years and how, how to learn to viol- play the violin, both, a person both studies the music and practices under a skillful instructor, a Christian should be taking intentional steps to be more like Jesus in whatever sphere of life that you're in. Discipleship defined. Um, one of my favorite people to listen to about discipleship is Dallas Willard. He's an author. He actually passed away in the last couple years, but he's an author who has helped me to understand the process of following Jesus Christ. This is how he defines discipleship. A disciple or apprentice 
is simply someone who has decided to be with another person under appropriate conditions in order to become capable of doing what that person does or to become what that person is, which in this case is Jesus. So I'm drawn to Dallas's Willard's phrase, apprentice of Jesus, because it emphasizes learning to follow him on a daily basis in whatever area of life you're in. So you are sons and daughters, your students, your shahi campers, um, your whole list of other things as well. Um, so how would you be Jesus' apprentice? How would you follow him in the current role that you're in? So Jesus, um, Jesus is making disciples in every area of life, in every sphere of life that he's created, and he's asking you to participate. You don't have to drop everything to be his disciple. You stay exactly where you are and do the things that Jesus would do as you participate in a church community, as you study his word, as you're challenged by teachers around you. You, do the, you use those things to help you to grow and be the person that he wants you to be in that sphere. So right now, as a shahi camper, who has Jesus called you to be this very week? How can you live as this, his disciple or apprentice this very week? Because discipleship or apprenticeship or building your house on the rock isn't a program, um, I don't, once again, I don't want to give you all your application here. I hope that God's been working through his Holy Spirit to give you that application. But two things that I wrote down, a couple general guidelines, is first, spend time in the Word of God. That's probably been my application for most of them today, but spend time in his Word. Be familiar with it. So in the realm of becoming Jesus' disciple, um, of course, I'm going to challenge you to read his entire word, Genesis to Revelation, and get to know the drama of Scripture, the entire picture from front to back. Um, but I would particularly like you to look at Jesus' life in the Gospels and what the early Christians did in the epistles to watch the early church function. I think that'll be especially helpful for you as you consider being his disciple or follower. Spend time in his word. And second, and this is an intentional kind of thing, I think we need to commit intentionally commit to practice what we're hearing. Not by our own power, but by asking God for his guidance and power every step along the way and allowing God to point out areas of our life that need change or adjustment. So many times in our life, we kind of need a realignment. Um, when you have a car, every once in a while you get an oil change and they say, do you want your, do you want your wheels to be rotated or things to be realigned? Because eventually your car gets out of a line from the bumps and bruises and different things along the road. Just like that, a car needs to be a realigned. Sometimes we need to be a realigned in our Christian lives. We're walking along and we have the trials and temptations of life kind of do a little bit of damage. And we need some help to be realigned in God's word and spending time with him, following him, and the church community help us to realign that life within him. One more quote I want to get from Dallas Willard. Um, it is a shorter, shorter little thing on discipleship that he said that I found it really helpful that clarifies Another important way of putting this, that is discipleship, is to say that if I am learning from Jesus, I am learning to live like Jesus, to live my life as he would live my life if he were I. That was confusing, so I'm going to read it again. Learning from Jesus to live my life as he would live my life if he were I. So basically, how would Jesus live my life? Let, let me do that. I'm going to leave you with something even better, the fruit of the Spirit as a short kind of a litmus test to see areas of your life where God may be working and where you could become more like Jesus. So I'm going to close with this, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 6.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The only way to produce true spiritual fruit is by the saving work of Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. And they are going to produce spiritual fruit that is evident to all who are watching. And that's going to make all the difference as we move on from living it to sharing it tomorrow. The lives we live can make all the difference in our witness for him. Let's pray. Father God, um, we come to you again um, thankful for your word to us. Um, the living word of God um, that helps guide us and shape us into who you've called us to be, Lord. 
Um, I pray that if anyone's here and doesn't know you and in a, in a, in a rela- has a relationship with you, I ask that they would, you would reveal yourself to them through your word. I pray that you might have already been doing that for them this week, Lord. I pray that they could, you would give them the strength to take that next step in coming to know you, Lord. I also to pray for the campers here that um, love you and have committed a life to you um, that just need your power and strength to live day by day and do the things that you would do, Lord. Just help them and guide them and help them to be representatives of you every step of the way, Lord, right here at camp this week. In your name, amen.